Chapter 19 We were nearly three hours in reaching the village, it being more than nine miles in the interior, and the path lying through a rugged country. As we passed along, the party of Chewit, the whole hundred and ten savages of the canoes, was momentarily strengthened by smaller detachments, of from two to six or seven which joined us, as if by accident at different turns of the road. There appeared so much of a system in this that I could not help feeling distrust, and I spoke to Captain Guy of my apprehensions. It was now too late, however, to recede, and we concluded that our best security lay in evincing a perfect confidence in the good faith of Tewit. We accordingly went on, keeping a wary eye upon the maneuvers of the savages, and not permitting them to divide our numbers by pushing in between. In this way, passing through a precipitous ravine, we at length reached what we were told was the only collection of habitations upon the island. As we came in sight of them, the chiefs set up a shout, and frequently repeated the word, Clock, clock, which we supposed to be the name of the village, or perhaps the generic name for villages. The dwellings were of the most miserable description imaginable, and unlike those of the lowest of the savage races with which mankind are acquainted, were of no uniform plan. Some of them, and these we found belonged to the Wampus or Yampus, the great men of the land, consisted of a tree cut down at about four feet from the root, with a large black skin thrown over it, and hanging in loose folds upon the ground. Under this the savage nestled, Others were formed by means of rough limbs and trees, with the withered foliage upon them made to recline at an angle of forty-five degrees against a bank of clay, heaped up without regular form to the height of five or six feet. Others again were mere holes dug in the earth perpendicularly, and covered over with similar branches, these being removed when the tenant was about to enter, and pulled on again when he entered. A few were built among the forked limbs of trees as they stood, the upper limbs being partially cut through, so as to bend over the lower, thus forming thicker shelter from the weather. The great number, however, consisted of small, shallow caverns, apparently scratched in the face of the precipitous ledge of dark stone, resembling fuller's earth, with which three sides of the village were bounded. At the door of each of these primitive caverns was a small rock, which the tenant carefully placed before the entrance upon leaving his residence. For what purpose I could not ascertain, as the stone itself was never of sufficient size to close up more than a third of the opening. This village, if it were worthy of the name, lay in a valley of some depth, and could only be approached from the southward the precipitous ledge of which I have already spoken, cutting off all access in other directions. Through the middle of the valley ran a brawling stream of the same magical-looking water which has been described. We saw several strange animals about the dwellings, all appearing to be thoroughly domesticated. The largest of these creatures resembled our common hog in the structure of body and snout. The tail, however, was bushy, and the legs slender as those of the antelope. Its motion was exceedingly awkward and indecisive, and we never saw it attempt to run. We noticed also several animals very similar in appearance, but of a greater length of body, and covered with a black wool. There were a great variety of tame fowls running about, and these seemed to constitute the chief food of the natives. To our astonishment we saw black albatross among these birds, in a state of entire domestication, going to sea periodically for food, but always returning to the village as a home, and using the southern shore in the vicinity as a place of incubation. There they were joined by their friends, the pelicans, as usual, but these later never followed them to the dwellings of the savages. Among the other kinds of tame fowls were ducks, differing very little from the canvas back of our own country, black gannets, and a large bird not unlike the buzzard in appearance, but not carnivorous. Of fish there seemed to be a great abundance. We saw during our visit a quantity of dried salmon, rock cod, blue dolphins, mackerel, blackfish, skate, conger eels, elephant fish, mullets, soles, parrotfish, leather jackets, gurnads, hake flounders, paracuttas, and innumerable other varieties. 
We noticed, too, that most of them were similar to the fish about the group of Lord Auckland's Island, in a latitude as low as 51 degrees south. The Galapago tortoise was also very plentiful. We saw but a few wild animals and none of a large size, or of a species with which we were familiar. One or two serpents of a formidable aspect crossed our path, but the natives paid them little attention, and we concluded that they were not venomous. As we approached the village with Two Wit and his party, a vast crowd of people rushed out to meet us, with loud shouts among which we could only distinguish the everlasting Anamumu and Lama Lama. We were much surprised at perceiving that, with one or two exceptions, these newcomers were entirely naked, and skins being used only by the men of the canoes. All the weapons of the country seemed to also be in the possession of the latter, for there was no appearance of any among the villagers. There were a great many women and children, the former not altogether wanting in what might be termed personal beauty. They were straight, tall, and well-formed, with a grace and freedom of carriage not to be found in civilized society. Their lips, however, like those of the men, were thick and clumsy, so that even when laughing the teeth were never disclosed. Their hair was of a finer texture than that of the males. Among these naked villagers there might have been ten or twelve who were clothed, like the party of Tuwit, in dresses of black skin, and armed with lances and heavy clubs. These appeared to have great influence among the rest, and were always addressed by the title Wampu. These two were the tenants of the black skin palaces. That of Two Wit was situated in the center of the village, and was much larger and somewhat better constructed than others of its kind. The tree which formed its support was cut off at a distance of twelve feet or thereabouts from the root, and there were several branches just below the cut, these serving to extend the covering, and in this way prevent its flapping about the trunk. The covering, too, which consisted of four very large skins, fastened together with wooden skewers, was secured at the bottom with pegs driven through it and into the ground. The floor was strewed with a quantity of dry leaves by way of carpet. To this hut we were conducted with great solemnity, and as many of the natives crowded in after us as possible. Two wit seated himself on the leaves, and made signs that we should follow his example. This we did, and presently found ourselves in a situation peculiarly uncomfortable, if not indeed critical. We were on the ground, twelve in number, with the savages, as many as forty, setting on their hams so closely around us that, if any disturbance had arisen, we should have found it impossible to make use of our arms, or indeed to have risen to our feet. The pressure was not only inside the tent, but outside where probably was every individual on the whole island, the crowd being prevented from trampling us to death only by the incessant exertions and vorifications of Two Wit. Our chief security lay, however, in the presence of Two Wit himself among us, and we resolved to stick by him closely, as the best chance of extricating ourselves from the dilemma, sacrificing him immediately upon the first appearance of hostile design. After some trouble, a certain degree of quiet was restored, when the chief addressed us in a speech at great length, and very nearly resembling the one delivered in the canoes, with the exception that the Anamumus were now somewhat more strenuously insisted upon than the Lama Lamas. We listened in profound silence until the conclusion of this harangue, when Captain Guy replied by assuring the chief of his eternal friendship and good will concluding what he had to say be a present of several strings of blue beads and a knife. At the former, the monarch, much to our surprise, turned up his nose with some expression of contempt, but the knife gave him the most unlimited satisfaction, and he immediately ordered dinner. This was handed into the tent over the heads of the attendants, and consisted of the palpitating entrails of a species of unknown animal probably one of the slim-legged hogs with which we had observed in our approach to the village. Seeing us at a loss how to proceed, he began by way of setting us an example, to devour yard after yard of the enticing food, until we could positively stand it no longer, and evinced such manifest symptoms of rebellion of stomach as inspired his majesty with a degree of astonishment, only inferior to that brought about by the looking-glasses. 
We declined, however, partaking of the delicacies before us, and endeavored to make him understand that we had no appetite whatsoever, having just finished a hearty dejeuner. When the monarch had made an end of his meal, we commenced a series of cross-questioning in every ingenious manner we could devise, with a view of discovering what were the chief productions of the country, and whether any of them might be turned to profit. At length he seemed to have some idea of our meaning, and offered to accompany us to a part of coast where he assured us the beach de mer, pointing to a specimen of that animal, was to be found in great abundance. We were glad of this early opportunity of escaping from the oppression of the crowd, and signified our eagerness to proceed. We now left the tent, and accompanied by the whole population of the village, followed the chief to the southeasterly extremity of the island, nor far from the bay where our vessel lay at anchor. We waited here for about an hour, until the four canoes were brought around by some of the savages to our situation. The whole of the party then getting into one of them, we were paddled along the edge of the reef before mentioned, and of another still farther out, where we saw a far greater quantity of birch de mere than the oldest seamen among us had ever seen in those groups of the lower latitudes most celebrated for this article of commerce. We stayed near these reefs only long enough to satisfy ourselves that we could easily load a dozen vessels with the animal if necessary, when we were taken alongside the schooner, and parted with two wit after obtaining from him a promise that he would bring us, in the course of twenty-four hours, as many of the canvas back ducks and Galapago tortoises as his canoes would hold. In the whole of this adventure we saw nothing in the demeanor of the natives calculated to create suspicion, with the single exception of the systematic manner in which their party was strengthened during our route from the schooner to the village.' 